I, I'm, I'm the chairman and chief executive of New World, and, uh, and with us here is George Stick, who's our executive director, and he's in charge of finance and operations. Sitting next to him is Peter Stick, his son, who's a qualified lawyer. Um, George has about 40 years of experience. The last 11 years, he's worked with me in, uh, in Victoria, Bramlin, in Cameroon, at UCOS. Peter and I uh, met in 1997 and got closely involved in uh, my UCOS days. He was a lawyer uh, practicing oil and gas law at, uh, at White and Case. Besides being one of the smartest people I know, he's actually an extremely competent transaction lawyer and, uh, and does a great job in all of our transactions. Fred Hodder and I met in 1997 in Kazakhstan. Fred's been on AIM before. He was the uh, chief financial officer of Nelson Resources. and I think he rode Nelson up to uh, one of the highest value companies on AIM in his time. So we have a very, very strong board. My background, I have 32 years of uh, oil and gas experience. I'm a qualified petroleum engineer. I, uh, before New World, I was a uh, director on Bramlin's board. Before that, I was managing director in Victoria Oil and Gas. Before that, I was an executive vice president at UCOS, controlling UCOS Central Asia. And before that, I'd worked for a few majors, Occidental Petroleum and Chevron, uh, in my career. Um, so going into an overview of the company, uh, New World was incorporated in early 2010. We took a full year to source projects. We listed in May of this year. We have 128 million shares on issue. The directors hold about 14%. Our uh, largest shareholder is Axa Framlington. It's a big, big fund here in, uh, in London. Uh, CQX just under 6%. We have other long-term holders and other holders, a lot of which are in this room, that constitute about 18 to 20%. And our free float's about 50%, best I can tell. Uh, we raised three million pounds uh, at, at the IPO. We went out as a shell, and that's really an AIM requirement. Uh, six weeks after um, our listing date, we raised another three million pounds. Our share price had kind of spiked up when we got our first project because uh, 34 days after listing, we completed our first project in Belize. And that's what caused the share price to go up. Our current market cap is about 12 and a half, 13 million pounds. Our share price is about, it's up almost twice what it was at listing. And today is about day 215. Really the summary is with our two projects, 34 day af four days after admission, we completed Belize. 124 days we completed Denmark. Today is day 215. So both of the projects, which I'll go into in greater detail, are really world, real, really world class. We, we had a pretty tough uh, criteria selection. So you'll, you'll see more about that later. But basically, you know, what New World Oil and Gas is about is some very, very, very experienced people. Besides the gentleman I just introduced, we have a tremendous technical team. Our geophysical and geologic team is probably the best I've worked with in 32 years. They're true oil finders. And we're about one thing, finding oil and gas. We're not about promoting it. We're not about placing equity to pay the light bill. We're about finding oil and gas. And in doing so, we, um, we want to deliver to our shareholders those multiples of 20, 30, 40 to 1. So when we put our strategy together, we said, okay, you know, we could look at early stage, which is very risky, early stage expiration, late stage expiration, expiration which has not quite as much risk. We could even go out and buy proven, developed, producing properties. We made the distinction early on to pursue late stage expiration because if you go out and buy a producing oil field, the seller is asking you to pay full price and sometimes on an escalated price stick. And work, what, kind of, what kind of multiple can you offer your shareholders? You know, unless you think oil price is going to go up 1,000% in a year. Unrealistic. So we focused on late stage, late stage exploration. We scoped over 70 projects worldwide that year before we listed. And we directed our focus to Central America, Denmark, Africa, and a few other areas that dropped off. And we focused on looking in basins that had prolific oil and gas reserves. But before we went out and approached some of these, uh, some of these vendors to, to acquire projects, um, we put together an investment criteria. That investment criteria for late stage exploration is early cash flow, uh, strong regional analogs, close to a world oil price where 
you know, focuses on off onshore projects where we would be named as operator, where we could apply, and you'll see this later, a multi-phased process of reducing risk through the application of technology that we've grown to become very accustomed to over, our, over the span of our careers. And finally, that we would end up with controlling interest. And that leads us to our first project, the Blue Creek Project, pardon me, in Belize. This is a map of Belize here. I'll tell you a little bit about Belize. Uh, the, the, the license blocks here are in red, and I'll refer to these as license blocks, what they really are, is they're territories that are um, contracted with the government of Belize under a single production sharing agreement, but I'll often call them licenses and it's the same thing. Uh, Belize is a small country, it's about the size of Wales. It's got um, about 313,000 people, it's just under 23,000 um, square kilometers, it's English speaking. Its, uh, its economy is largely based on tourism and agriculture. It exports 100% of its oil production and imports 100% of its fuels. Um, it's, it's just a great place, English speaking, beautiful in the subtropics. You see here you got southern Mexico and then Guatemala and this is the Caribbean Sea. It also has the second largest living reef in the world right behind the Great Barrier Reef. It's quite a destination. The blocks themselves, there are two blocks that constitute 420 square kilometers, about 104,000 acres. So a little bit about the geologic setting. This is the uh, Yucatan Peninsula here. We're located in what's called the Patine Basin. The Patine Basin has generated some 70 billion barrels of proven oil reserves. Our particular license block area is in this area close to the Spanish lookout field. Uh, Spanish Lookout right now is producing about uh, between four and 5,000 barrels a day. There are two fields actually, Spanish Lookout and Never Delay. Um, our CP actually characterizes this as a, a, an active working hydrocarbon system, which I'll go into in a little bit more detail later. One of the good things about Belize, it's actually only 850 miles away from the Gulf Coast. And because Belize exports 100% of their oil, they get a WT, uh, West Texas Intermediate Oil Price. Uh, what we got involved with here in Belize is we got involved with a company called Blue Creek Exploration where we farmed into these license blocks or these two blocks. Um, and basically what we did is we agreed to acquire up to 100% working interest upon the completion of two phases of seismic and two wells, which took us all the way, or which will take us all the way up to 100% working interest, revert the farm order to a 5% override, and we were named as operator. This is the license area, a little more detail. And these are, it's, it's, this is called a base topo map with seismic lines on it. Phase one and two seismic are complete. We've already been uh, assigned 12.5% working interest. The next 12.5% working interest will come sometime in uh, January. We decided to break up phase two seismic into a phase three for a couple of reasons. The main reason was is during the wet season, uh, Belize actually got about 70 inches of rain this year, and we had a lot of freestanding water in this area, the license block. It's low. And Instead of mobilizing in marsh phones and other equipment to deal with that and spend a couple million dollars, we decided to wait for it to dry up and do it in January during the dry season. Um, these two wells right here, the, the Quam Hill and the Canal Bank wells, were drilled by our neighbor, and they both had oil shows with oil saturations up to 50%. They were not completed as commercial producers because they're, they're below, they're low, below the uh, known oil water contacts that we see up on our block and that Belize Natural Energy sees on their block. Um, so our plan is to complete phase three seismic in Q1, and after that will come another CPR, where we'll update the entire interpretation of, of the block, following by, in the first half of uh, 2012, a mobilization of a base camp, and then we'll pick up a rig and commence drilling our first, our first well in the second half of the year. These are actually mud pits of the Quam Hill and Canal Bank wells. You can see they circulated up a considerable amount of oil. So the, the hydrocarbon system works there. This is a, a, a slide which shows the difference between our data, which is right here, and Belize Natural Energy's data on the neighboring field in Spanish Lookout. Remember, Spanish Lookout's producing 4,200 barrels a day. They look like to be on track to uh, recover 
a total volume of about 25 million barrels. Our phase one seismic was more of a regional shoot so that we could, we could correlate these productive intervals in the upper Cretaceous from Spanish Lookout into our block, which we were successful in doing. Phase two was more of a higher density grid uh, designed to, for us to get comfortable with the trapping mechanism. Take a look at this trap mechanism here. It's hard to see, but you can have, we have rollover in the Cretaceous in a fault system which trapped the oil and kept the oil when it was migrating from its source from migrating past, hence they produce from it. We have a look-alike to it. And so we think we're answering a lot of the question, uh, questions which exist in, you know, does or does not a hydrocarbon accumulation exist in our blocks. This is the interpretation that came out of the uh, phase two seismic. We have six structures, what we call six aerial um, closures. You know, we have BMAC, Seacrest, A, D, C, and C South. D is actually still a lead, but the other five are, are prospects. So what we did uh, with our CP is uh, we went to calculating volumetrics on those using all the offset well data we could get our hands on, plus the seismic data. Now what we've come up with is we came up with five potential zones across all the prospects in this lead here. And after looking at all this seismic data, our CP came up with a one in five probability of geologic success. That's up 62.5% from our last, CP, last CPR. We identified two drill ready prospects. These are prospects that had uh, more or less the best probability of geologic success. You know, we have a range of like 19.9 to 21.1, and A and B crest ranked right up there at 21.1. So what we did is we calculated the volumetrics in A and B crest and came up with 294 million barrels. A little bit bigger than what we were aiming for to begin with, but remember, Spanish lookout was our lookalike. That was our analog. So we were pleasantly surprised with that. If you add up the total P50 volume for all the prospects in the lead, it's just over a billion barrels. These are recoverable volumes. These are not in place volumes. And they're all in the prospective resource category. So we kind of went way off the grid. In other words, we were expecting to see, you know, 25 to 50 million barrel accumulations. And actually, personally, when I started to look at the mapping of the, uh, of the first, first pass post phase one, I was thinking more like 60 to possibly 150 million barrels, we were, we were quite surprised with the outcome here. So this is uh, where our two drill sites will be for our first two wells. Why are they there? Well, our first well will be uh, what we call B Crest. It sits way up in the attic. And what, what happens when oil and gas migrates from its source up through sedimentary plains and fractures and so on, it accumulates in the attic of a reservoir as long as it has a seal, right? And this just comes out just as a, you know, shining obvious first target. B, a similar, uh, a similar signature on seismic, which I'll show you here in just a second. But what's the volumetrics of these two? Well, of A, pardon me, of A, the uh, P50 results, recoverable 92 million barrels, and B crest, P50, 202 million barrels. That's where the, the 294 come from. The, uh, the values, the NPV tens of A and B crest, work out to be just about $7 billion. That means if you lift 294 million barrels at about 70,000 barrels a day through a ramp up of capex and a number of wells to drill, and you put it on a decline similar to Spanish lookout, and we actually put it on a decline more aggressive than that, that's where your net present value comes from. The expected monetary value, which is something our CPR, our CP generated for our CPR, it's an indicator, it's, 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 sort, of a, it's sort of a litmus test. It's sort of a, you know, when you, when you look at EMV, it's a decision-making tool. It's not something that represents estimated market value. And when we take the PV10 numbers of both prospect A and B crash, remember we're only talking about two prospects, not the whole, not the whole six. Uh, the total number comes out to be about 1.5 uh, billion U.S. There's the calculation there in the bottom if you want to check my math. Um, EMV risk, what does this mean? What, you know, what do all these numbers mean when you look at a company that's trading, I think when we close out today, just under 10p? Um, what does it mean? I calculated yesterday at just under 9.5p, or just right at 9.5p. 
If we achieve the EMV on prospect A, our share price would reflect a change of about 56 times to 545p a share. If we were successful in making the discovery in B Crest and calculated EMV of 440 million, we'd go up about 22 times or to 220p per share. So we do good if we make a discovery. It's nice to know these things <coughs> because once you know where you're at and where you want to go, the distinction's the plan. And you know, we think we've got enough uh, experience and technology to hopefully get us there. Well, this is an unrest EMV, a rest EMV, in other words, where you take the product of your EMV times your probability of geologic success. The uplift in prospect A is about 10 times from our close of yesterday, and in prospect B crests about five times. So, you know, about 15, maybe, maybe 14, 16 times where we're at today. This is prospect A, and I enlarged this. So you can get a sense of where we're drilling. We're drilling down to 11,400 feet. Our obligation is to drill to the top of the Jurassic. You can see here the, the fault displacement of the upper Cretaceous intervals. We have about 360 feet of throw at the location of Prospect A. All the tools in our, that, that we have at our disposal, which, is, which has been able to uh, enable us to calculate this throw, tells us provides us with a great deal of confidence. We have a trapping mechanism there. Take a look at uh, Spanish Lookout. They have about 160 feet of throw. We have about 360 feet of throw, and they have a trap and seal. See, we're comparing it to, we're comparing our, um, our prospects and the, and the nature of our prospects to Spanish Lookout so we can kind of forensically, forensically look back and say, okay, what did they do, what do they have, and what constituted their traps, and what's similar between those and ours. This is B Crest. It's very similar to A, but we have just a little bit more throw, and we also have a structural high at the hill bank, and what appears to be structure in between the Y2 and the hill bank. Likely with these throws, the, uh, the, you know, we'll have accumulation of oil between all, all four sections, the Y1, the Y2, this wide section here, the Y3, and the hill bank, which is the bottom of the Cretaceous interval. So let me uh, talk a little bit about the uh, working hydrocarbon system so I can get to like the meat of it and what we're doing here. You know, a working hydrocarbon system is uh, source. Where does the oil come from? What's the source rock? Migration, maturation, trap, and seal. We know from our uh, analysis and technical work that the oil which produces out of Spanish Lookout, and this is the Mike Usher number one, their discovery well, produces 1,200 barrels a day. We know that the oil from that matches the oil that was found in Quam Hill and Canal Bay and matches properties found in our geochemical analysis um, up on Blue Creek on our block. So it comes from the same source. Our block sits between the depot center of the source and Spanish Lookout. We know that trap and seal exist because we see fault throw, very similar to Spanish Lookout. And so we're confident that we have that part, that element of the hydrocarbon system working for us. What, what we don't know is the timing of migration. In other words, did the oil migrate from its source and migrate past before these faults occurred and we only have residual oil left in place? Remember, these faults occur because of tectonic activity, earthquakes. You know, we're very near a subduction zone where the Pacific Plate plunges underneath the Caribbean Plate, right? And, you know, you see a lot of uh, seismic activity, earthquakes. Remember the Haiti earthquake? There's a lot of that out there. And, and the other question is, did the oil migrate from its source before the tectonic activity in the region caused these fault displacements to occur? And we have a trap and an accumulation. You won't know until you pick up the drill bit. We're kind of like forensic scientists. We're just trying to eliminate items like trap, seal, migration. We won't know until we drill. But I think we've covered all of our bases here. So to, uh, to summarize where we're at in Belize, 
These are really excerpts of what the, what the competent person states. These really aren't our words, but basically he says the licenses are highly prospective. The seismic interpretation is very similar to Spanish Lookout. We're in close proximity to other producing fields. The CP states we have an active working hydrocarbon system in Blue Creek. We've shot 145 kilometers of 2D between uh, phase one and phase two seismic. We've improved our probability of, ge uh, of geologic success materially through the application of this technology you've just seen. And we've come up with the numbers I've just told you. One and a half billion EMV, uh, just under 300 million barrels P50 in the two prospects in a PV10 valuation of uh, seven billion dollars. So on to the next project, Denmark. Denmark, uh, we, is, it, this is an onshore play here. It's located in what's called the Permian Basin. Um, the two license blocks that we're involved in are called license blocks 109 and 209. Probably somebody passing out from hearing all this. <laughs> probably, most of you did when you picked up the CPR yesterday, yeah? <laughs> Um, it's, it, the, the two license blocks are, are 4,100 square kilometers. That's about, about 1,014,000 acres. It's a vast area. It's huge. Um, and what we did is we, we um, entered into a farm out agreement with a farmer called Danica Jetland, where we were assigned 80% working interest. They retain a 5% override. We have a 20% paying partner, which is the Danish government. And trust me, when you get involved with the Danes, these people are very, very thorough. They check you out. And, and we're delighted that, that we passed all their tests and they welcomed us as, their, as both their partner and just recently on the 9th of this month, they have officially named us as operator. We had our first operating committee meeting in, uh, in uh, November. We've had our seismic program and our work program and budget approved by the Danish government. So we're moving forward. In fact, George is going to get the seismic permitting guy going here in days, and it'll take about eight weeks for us to complete our seismic permitting, and then we'll roll right into phase one of a two-phase seismic program similar to Belize. This is the uh, Permian Basin here in pink. You can see the coast of England and Scotland. You can see, uh, you know, the, the Dutch, and the, this is the... Uh, Danish Peninsula here, and then you go off into Germany and Poland. The Permian Basin is responsible for about 80% of the North Sea, Norwegian sector, Danish sector, and the Baltic Sea's hydrocarbon production. It's a very, very prolific oil basin. This is a, this is a base topo of our two license blocks here. You can see 109 in red and, 10, and 209 in, uh, in blue. The little blue squiggly lines are our proposed seismic lines. We're going to actually shoot about 160 line kilometers. The blocks themselves had about 1,106 line kilometers to begin with, hence making them late stage. And about 306 were reprocessed, which set up the interpretation that we have today. This is a seismic section. You'll see that the, the resolution is very, very, very high quality uh, in Denmark. You know. This is a line from north to south, so you see the northern Permian Basin truncate up and shallow up, and then you have a graben which separates the north Permian from the south Permian. This is a seismic section which is enlarged from one of the lines that we reprocessed. And in here, we see what we call AVO bright spots. We did some um, what's called amplitude versus offset technology in our processing of our seismic. It's called a direct hydrocarbon indicator. What it does is it measures change a rapid change, a rapid drop in density at depth. And that would indicate either you have a porous interval or you have a very soft clay or something that's very low dense, right? It has very low density. Well, the, the Tonder is at 5,800 feet and the Boonter is at about 7,500 feet. And you have a tremendous amount of weight of rock above you. And if you've got something that's low dense in there, of low density in there, it's probably gas. But it's probably under enough pressure to support the weight of the rock above you. And we think that there are pre there's gas present both in this interval and this interval in the Triassic. In fact, we think, and the CP thinks it so much, he gave us one in five probability of geologic success right out of the blocks. Normally, you kind of earn your stripes, you know, going from one in 12 to one in eight and one in five like we did in Belize. He came right out of the blocks at, uh, 
at one and five. This is a, a geochem map which maps out our, um, our eight Zechstein carbonate prospects and also our two Triassic prospects. This is a surface seep analysis. You, if you look at it closely, you can see a comparison between the two. Um, there's, there's clearly a presence of hydrocarbon out here. And so we've generated one CPR, and our CP tells us that this is an interesting opportunity to, ass to assess late stage expiration, our target. He says the reef and shoal facies are likely to contain excellent reservoirs. The potential is, is, is pretty strong to contain multiple productive horizons, you know, the Zechstein, the shallower um, Triassic. Um, they fully endorse the AVO work that we've done. And what we plan to do is we plan to, we go out there and shoot seismic, we're going to shoot a perpendicular line to the seismic line that we see the AVO on. And what we're going to do is we'll be able to, if we see AVO in the perpendicular line, be able to map in the horizontal plane the area of the potential gas accumulation and calculate volumetrics because we know its thickness. Um, again, he gives us the one in five. He's calling it Triassic plays prospects and the Zechstein plays prospects and leads. He actually gives us about a one and eight to the, uh, to the Zechstein. And again, we've obtained approval from the North Sea Fund and from the government as operator. And our plan is to jump right into, um, into our seismic plan. So what's our investment case? It's simple. New world. It's an exciting opportunity for shareholders to participate in an undervalued company with a well thought out plan in late stage exploration with a strong team. You know, you've seen the results in Belize and Denmark to date. I don't need to go through the numbers again with you, but effectively what we're about is making an oil and gas discovery. We're not going to make a career of placing equity. We're not going not to make a career of just prolonging our results and hope that we get something going on. The way you actually succeed long term is to find and produce oil and gas, period. And that's what we're about. We have a very, very strong team, like I said. Our, our projects are quality late stage exploration as expressed by, the, uh, by the, the competent person. And we're fully funded to the stage of drilling. So what's our news flow? This is an interesting part. Our news flow coming up is as uh, completion of phase three seismic in Belize will be in February. A CPR will follow, which will be a CPR that updates the entire license block area, just not phase three. We will then have uh, uh, announcements connected to the mobilization of our base camp, the commencement of drilling operations in 12. We expect to have drilling results by the end of 12 for our first well. And then we'll roll right into a CPR update from that, followed by um, the commencement of uh, the second well in 13. And by the second half of 13, we'll have results and then a CPR to follow. In Denmark, um, we'll be completing our permitting in about eight weeks or so. And then we'll roll right into the phase one seismic program I showed you there. We'll do an update to our CPR. And then we'll put on our thinking caps as to what we're going to do. I can tell you that with one in five, you're really not going to get much better probability of geologic success in 2D. And we're deep enough where you know we can apply 3D, but in the uh, in the Triassic, it's a little bit uh, it's a little bit borderline. The, the arithmetic behind deciding whether or not you're going to shoot a 3D is you take the dry hole cost times 0.65, take the product of that. Um, divided by about $200,000, and that equals the number of square kilometers you can shoot for that particular, uh, you know, 65% of your dry hole costs, your well costs. And the, uh, the Triassic gets us into, into a smaller 3D, so to say. But we look at the deep Zexon clays, it'll, we can get into a larger 3D, 250, 300 square kilometers. We're also maintaining our pipeline of projects. Um, you know, we haven't pushed anything at light speed. We're focusing on what we have. But should we have uh, success in some of the projects we're looking at, we may have news flow for that as well. So our share price performance, there it is. We started out at 5P and did really well. We closed Belize. And we just kind of got caught in that vortices with the Euro and the Eurozone and all that. And uh, I remember sitting in Belize and talking to George and saying, you know, we got to come out and we got we to gotta open people's eyes up. We're trading at 98%. Our cash reserves are 98% of market cap. 
and we went into Manchester, opened their eyes, a lot of you were there, and we had a big, huge, nice correction within days, and we got up over our listing price. And since then, there's been a lot of anticipation about the results of the CPR, you know? And, and I think that's what's fueled our, uh, our, our increase in share price to date. So to wrap it up, again, we're focused on making discoveries. That's what we're all about. Um, we're interested because we're in late stage exploration, providing shareholders this, you know, 20, 30, 40 to 1. That's what I would have said in Manchester. Now I'm looking more like uh, 60, 70, 80 to 1 <laughs> if they work out. Um, you know, late stage exploration doesn't come with a high entry fee. You know, you go out and you buy producing reserves, you pay a lot of money. Although it's not small money, it's still less than you would if you bought a producing asset. Um, we've seen strong results in our CPR, which give us, uh, you know, more excitement to move forward. We see uh, that we can continue to reduce risk by applying a multi-phase approach, particularly in Denmark at this stage, but remember we have phase three seismic to shoot in, in Belize. We're fully funded to drilling and we're focused, um, trust me on this, we're focused on minimizing dilution. I'm a shareholder of many companies myself and that's something that concerns me. And a lot of the shareholders here will tell you that they have pretty readily access, ready access to us via email and so on. And we're real careful not to bring anybody inside. I mean, look, we're real ethical. But in terms of clarification, what does this mean? What does that mean? Can you tell me? You know, we, we communicate. We reply to every single email, every single phone call, even if it's somebody looking for a job. <laughs> and and you know, we, we, that's something I think that, that we do maybe a little better than our competition. Um, and finally, um, what we... Uh, what we've had is we've had a, a number of companies approach us and ask us to, uh, if you will, uh, look into what we have and potentially participate in our project. So in response to that, we've decided to set up a virtual data room at our competent person's office where qualified companies uh, can come in, and look at the data, and put together an expression of interest or an offer to participate. So what does that mean in our funding strategy? If we find the right company, what we can do is we can, you know, uh, farm down some of our interests, pick up some capital, defray our risk, and live to continue to grow and find another day. And as well, have a carried interest, which adds value to our shareholders. I can't tell you who these companies are. We're bound by terms of confidentiality, but I can tell you. One's a large public American company, one's a large public Canadian company, and the others are small privately funded groups. So uh, that wraps it up. I, I want to thank my directors and they're here to answer questions. They're great guys and I want to thank our employees, especially our G&G &G team and the guys in Belize. They're tremendous. I, I wish they were here. You'd really get the same sense of quality. Uh, in addition to that, our advisors, and I see many of them out here, you know, Shore and St. Bride, they're doing a great job. But mostly I want to thank all you shareholders. Without you, we wouldn't, uh, we wouldn't be here. So when you guys think about, you know, low risk, late stage exploration with a, a well thought out plan and a quality management team, look no further than New World. We'll deliver. Thank you. Thank you.